So, so for many years now, uh, people have been working on trip-assisted skills. And by trip-assisted skills, we mean skills which contain about, say, 60 or 70 percent of electromorphic ferrite. The remainder is a mixture of magnetic ferrite and retained austenite, and there might be some magnetic that as well. And the typical composition of such steels is 0.15 weight percent carbon, 1.5 manganese, 1.5 silicon, the silicon being there to stop the precipitation of cementite so that the carbon remains in the austenite. And what I want to ask is what is the role of transformation in this plasticity in such steels? And the conclusion I'm going to reach is that there's hardly any role of transformation in this plasticity. But I need to show you how we reach that conclusion. Now, if you look at the whole range of phase transformations that we get, uh, then these are the sort of shape deformations that we get due to the transformation. So with a lot of the ferrite, we are really only concerned with the volume change. Uh, and similarly with perlite, we are only concerned with volume change. There's no shear deformation. With all of these transformations, we also have this large shear deformation and the volume change. So when we talk about transformation in this plasticity, we should really take account of all of these deformations, not just a volume change, yeah, because there's shear deformation as well as a volume change. And of course, uh, in the last lecture, I showed you an atomic force microscope image for the shape change to bainite. Trip assisted steels, the austenite is transforming to martensite. And the martin side itself will produce a shape change, and you can see these scratches have been deflected by martensitic transformations. It's well known yeah, that you can measure the shape deformation by looking at scratches. So it's a physical displacement. And the way in which this displacement occurs is unique. So this is if you do a uniaxial tensile test and the Poisson's ratio is zero, then you will get no distortion in this direction. So all of the volume change happens along one direction. And this plane itself is completely unchanged. So beryllium, for example, has a Poisson's ratio of nearly zero. So when you pull it, you don't get any contraction this way. So this is uh, an invariant plane strain because it leaves this plane undeformed, but there's a volume change. Now, when we look at ordinary slip deformation, it's a shear. But again, it leaves this plane completely unchanged. That's an invariant plane. If I combine these two deformations, then that is the sort of shape change accompanying microstatic transformation. There's a shear deformation and there's a volume change normal to the habit plane. So when we do measurements, this is precisely the sort of shape change due to martensitic transformation. Now, I explained to you in the last lecture that I wasn't going to talk about the nucleation of ferrite from austenite because it's very complicated. You cannot shear austenite into ferrite. It's not possible. So you should already be thinking, you know, Harry is saying that you cannot shear austenite into ferrite. <laughs> but, you know, when we look at the shape change, there's a shear. Yeah. So there's something, something wrong. When you look at the shape change, it's a shear deformation. But at the same time, it's impossible to change austenite into ferrite by a shear. So there's something is wrong. Now, in order to get magnetic transformation, you must have a certain amount of coherency in the interface. And the minimum amount of coherence you need is one coherent line. A single line in the interface must have exact fitting between the austenite and martin side. So there must exist an invariant line in the interface. 
you can of course have more than one coherent line, in which case it would be a fully coherent interface. But that's very unlikely, except in the case of the austenite to hexagonal close back I transformation. So let's let's see whether we can change austenite into ferrite and leave one line completely coherent. If we can find that line, then it's possible to get monoxidic transformation. If we cannot find that line, it's impossible to get monoxide. Now, of course, you know that uh, we can get monoxide in steels. So we must be able to find a coherent line. So let me show you how we get a coherent line. So this is the unit cell of austenite. And here I've drawn two unit cells of austenite next to each other, the black. So you can see this is face centered, face centered. There's one unit cell and another. Now inside that, I can redefine the unit cell of austenite instead of being face centered cubic. So unfortunately, with the Bain strain, there is no line that remains coherent. You can find an undistorted line, but not a line which remains coherent. Bain strain, you know, it was proposed in 1924, and it is a part of all textbooks, does not produce a coherent line between martinside and austin. Okay. If I go back, this is also the wrong orientation relationship. When we look at the orientation relationship between ferrite and austenite, we don't find that the 001 direction of austenite is parallel to 001 of austenite. We don't find that the 100 of ferrite is parallel to 110 of austenite. We find a relationship like Kuljumov Sachs or Nishiya Mavasana. So the Bain strain doesn't even explain the orientation relationship. Now, supposing I take my uh, austenite, apply the Bain strain, and then I rotate the magic site so that this line becomes exactly parallel to this. Okay, so Bain strain plus a rigid body rotation, that produces an invariant line, a fully coherent line between the mitral side and the side. And that extra rotation gives me exactly the right orientation relationship. Okay. So you can predict the orientation relationship exactly by taking the austenite, applying the Bain strain, and then rotating so that I get a coherent line that predicts exactly the orientation relationship between Austin and Marx. So we've solved a part of the problem. But we only have one line coherent. In other words, I can't shear the austenite into Martin's side because to shear, I would require a whole plane to be coherent. So there's still something wrong because the shape change we see is a shear. But the base strain plus a rigid body rotation is not a shear deformation. It just leaves one line coherent. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. Uh, <coughs> supposing that this is my austenite and I transform it to martensite, then I get, I, I shear this to get martensite. Then that's the correct shape change. That's what we observe. But that must be the wrong crystal structure because you can't change austenite into martensite by a shear. In order to change it to martensite, I have to apply another shear along here. So I only leave one line which is coherent. But then I have the wrong shape. Yeah? So I can either get the right shape and the wrong crystal structure or the wrong shape and the right crystal structure. To go from austenite to martensite, I have to have a combination of the base strain and the rigid body rotation, which is not a shear. Nevertheless, when I observe the shape change, I have this, not this. Okay. Now, the problem was solved by Bowles and Mackenzie. I can alter the shape without altering the crystal structure by periodically slipping the crystal. So the macroscopic shape here is correct and the crystal structure is correct. Or I can periodically pin it 
produce the correct macroscopic shape and the correct crystal structure. And that's why we see twins inside Martin's eye or slip steps. Okay. Now we have the complete theory that we can predict the orientation relationship by doing the Bain strain and the rotation which gives a fully coherent line. And the macroscopic deformation is a shape. It goes to all this trouble because effectively this is a coherent plane. On a long range it's a coherent plane, it's an invariant plane. But on a short range there are strains there. Yeah. This also explains why we have these really strange habit planes for modern side, like 3, 10, 15, 2, 2, 5. Why on earth should nature choose such complicated planes? Okay. Why not 1, 1, 1? The reason is these particular planes are nice planes like 1, 1, 1. But the average plane here is very complicated, like 3, 10, 15. So everything is explained by this theory of martensite and that's why the macroscopic shape change we get when martensite forms is like shear. Okay, so let's go back to our trip steels now. Uh, typically, it looks like this. This is ferrite. We have these regions here, which consist of a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. And notice this is polycrystalline. Everything I talked about before was for a single crystal of austenite transforming to a single crystal of martensite. And when you look at it in a transmission electron micrograph, those hard regions consist of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. And it's this retained austenite which is supposed to transform to martensite under strain and add to the ductility of these steels. These steels have very good ductility compared even with dual phase steels. Yeah. So for the same strength level, you can get greater ductility in these steels than dual phase steels. So that's the microstructure. And the argument is, in many papers, is that it is the transformation of this austenite which gives you the great ductility. Well, first of all, uh, let's imagine we have a polycrystalline sample. We transform it to margin site, then of course we will get a volume change. Yeah. If you look over here, this is the same bar and this has increased in volume. So the density of margin site is different from that of austenite, so we get a volume expansion. But what's happened to the shear? Yeah, I don't see any shear deformation there. Well, because the plates are forming in many, many orientations, they cancel out the shears and therefore macroscopically we see no effect of the shear deformation. You only see the effect of the shear deformation if you bias the microstructure. That means you form certain orientations of plates and not others. And of course when you do transformation under stress, you will favor those plates of martensite which relieve the stress. Okay. So here, the margin side is not forming at random, but it is forming in a preferred orientation, and that's why we shear the whole shape of the polycrystalline specimen. And if this is in a tensile testing machine, we will have uh, a rotation as well. Yeah. So we see an elongation of the specimen, caused purely by margin side transformation. Yeah. So I'd like to calculate how much elongation we get if the whole of this austenite transforms into martensite in the right orientation. Okay. And remember that we are talking about polycrystalline specimens. So, first thing is how can we bias the microstructure? Well, obviously when you are forming your trip steel into your car component, there is going to be stresses. And those stresses favor certain orientations of martensite. And this is the shape, def shape definition. Now, when you apply a stress to an ordinary steel, certain slip systems will be activated, other slip systems will not. 
And those slip systems which are activated are those which have the largest shear stress okay, along the shear direction. Similarly, for margin side, when I apply a stress, that stress will be resolved into two components. One is normal to the habit plane, and one is along the habit plane. So this is a shear stress, and this is a normal stress on the habit plane of the margin side. And that will give me a mechanical driving force <laughs> here, which is the normal stress times the volume change, plus the shear stress times the shear strain of the transformation. And for those orientations for which the mechanical driving force is largest, they will be favored. So this is why we can stimulate Martin side to form above the MS temperature. Because we have a mechanical driving force which is stimulating Martin side. <coughs> and that mechanical driving force is different depending on the state of stress. So when you have new axial <coughs> tension, it's the largest effect because that tension is along, it favors shear and it's along the direction of the volume change. When you have uniaxial compression, the volume change opposes the compression, <coughs> okay? but the shear is exactly the same as in tension. And then you can have more complicated effects with multiaxial stresses. So we can calculate that mechanical driving force by resolving the applied stress along the orientation of the habit plane. So theta is simply the orientation of the Martin side plane with respect to the applied stress. And you can easily show that the value of theta for which you will have the largest mechanical driving force is about 42 degrees. Now why isn't it 45 degrees? Because it's not just a shear, there's also a volume. Okay. So you expect Martin side plates to form at about 42 degrees to the applied stress. And that's exactly what you see. So this is a sample of austenite, this is a stress axis, and you can see yeah, you can see plates are forming approximately at 45 degrees to the applied stress. And this is a polycrystalline specimen, not a single crystal. <coughs> Because each grain can form 24 different variants, it's possible to find something which is close to 45 degrees. So here, you not only have the effect of the volume change, but you can also pick up the effect of the shear strain. Right, now let us try and calculate what is the maximum tensile strain that we obtain from transformation plus system. Supposing we form mount inside at exactly the right orientation and transform all of the austenite into mount inside, what is the maximum elongation that we should get? So in a fully austenitic sample which transforms completely into mount inside of exactly the right orientation, how much <coughs> elongation should we get? Well, we can represent this shape deformation as a matrix like this where this is the shear strain and this is the volume change and we have these values from experiments. So this is just a mathematical representation of this deformation. So the effect of that deformation will be to change a vector u into a new vector v which will not only be longer but it may be in a different orientation as well. So supposing I take my vector u as this vector, then as a consequence of that shape change it becomes a new vector and therefore I can work out the elongation. Yeah. And the value that you get is 14% elongation if the whole of the austenite transforms into exactly the right orientation of my you get 14% elongation. Now, is that the reason why trip steels are very ductile? Well, the answer has to be no, because we don't have 100% austenite in a trip steel. We have actually very little austenite, you know, 12% typically. That means that if I take my 
coding for the elongation. And I multiply it by the volume fraction of austenite, and that gives me the amount of elongation I should get if all of that austenite transformed into martensite in the trip steel. Notice that the typical elongations we observe in trip steels are around 25%. Okay. Um, so if I go back to this and I and 0.12 because we have 12% of austenite and that comes to approximately 1.4% elongation so if all of the austenite in my trip steel transformed into my inside of the right orientation I would expect 1.4% elongation what we observe is a lot more so Trip cannot explain why we get so much elongation in the so-called trip-assisted steels. And that's why I wrote a paper which was two pages. The title was Trip-Assisted Steels? Question <laughs> mark. You cannot explain the elongation in terms of trip. Maybe the name is wrong. Okay. So what is the reason? This is just to show you that you know, we've got many, many steels which show the same sort of properties as strip assisted steels, but which don't contain any retained austenite. Okay, they show similar properties to strip assisted steels, but don't contain any retained austenite. So the contribution from retained austenite is very small to the elongation. And I think what we have forgotten is that we are not dealing with a homogeneous material. We are actually dealing with a composite material in which the properties of the ferrite are very different from the properties of the hard base. So when I apply a stress here, at first this will not deform at all because it's strong. All the deformation will be accommodated in the softer phase. It's only when you get a lot of work hardening in the ferrite that you will begin to transfer stress into the hard phase. And that is a good thing. That's a good thing because the hard phase does not have a great deal of ductility. So if it starts to deform very late in the tensile test, then you've got all the benefits of strength. And you can exploit the fact that it has a very small amount of elongation by itself. And of course, this, this kind of work was done a long time ago where you, you can calculate you know, the strain in the hard phase and the strain in the soft phase. And you can see that you have much greater strain in the soft phase than in the hard phase. It only starts to deform at a much later stage in the tensile test. And that's why we get good properties from this material, is that we are getting strength from the hard phase, <coughs> but we are not suffering from the low ductility of the hard phase because it only starts to deform plastically at a late stage of the tensile test. So I won't go into the theory for, uh, for the composite deformation theory, which is well established. Okay. But to summarize, you know, the assistance from trip is very, very small of the total strain. So, why are these steels better than, say, the dual phase steels, which have also got a hard phase and a soft phase? And the answer is that we are actually producing martensite, which is very hard, a high carbon martensite, at a very late stage in deformation. In the dual phase steels, we have the martensite from the very beginning. So we are not suffering from the low ductility of the martensite phase. So transformation is important, but transformation plasticity is probably contributing very little. And this is an optimistic calculation because it's assuming that martensite forms in the correct orientation. So we should shift the emphasis from the retained austenite studies to looking at the composite behavior of these steels. And that's the reason why even low silicon steels where we have less retained austenite seem to perform extremely well. Uh, this is just to show you that 
the calculation of 1.4% of elongation is very optimistic. Because if I do an experiment with 100% margin size, 100% uh, austenite transforming to 100% margin size, the total elongation I get from transformation plasticity is very small, 0.01, 1%. Because you will not form the most favored variants. It's a polycrystalline specimen. A lot of the variants will form in different orientations from those which favor elongation. If it was a single crystal, then maybe right, but we are dealing with a polycrystalline specimen, so the maximum strain that you can expect is, is not very large. We can also show this by using pressure. Okay. If, we, if we apply hydrostatic pressure, then we can prevent the transformation, and yet we can get a great deal of elongation from the composite microstructure. So here we are applying a huge hydrostatic pressure of 800 megapascals, and yet in that steel we can get a lot of elongation. So even if we prevent the transmission of austenite, we can get a lot of elongation. So to finish, trip assisted steels are, are good in terms of elongation because we are delaying the transformation of austenite until a late stage of the tensile test. So we are producing the hard phase late in the tensile deformation test. And that's good because that hard phase has very little ductility. Okay. At first we are absorbing the plastic deformation in the soft phase. And we are benefiting from the strength of the bainite plus retained austenite mixture. That's all I have to say about trip assisted steels and the role of retained austenite. The engineering point of view, most of the people explain the activity of the ship, not the fact that you were in the examination. And, and most of the examination uh, stays like this. The magnetic transformation to induce a lot of dislocation, free dislocation. This can accommodate the deformation strength purely plastic and plastic deformation. This is the reason. That is not the reason why you get a high ductility, but it's the reason, it is a very important reason why you get gradual healing. You know, because you need that if you're going to use it for power components so that you, you don't have stretch strains. Yeah. Now, gradual healing happens because of inhomogeneous deformation. So you, the martensitic transformation, or even the presence of the hard phase, introduces three dislocations. So that's an explanation for gradual. Don't you think? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how about the the location? Location of martensite during passage. Location of the hard phase. Right. Do you see the any contribution? You know, if you get the balance between the hard and the soft phase wrong, that means you know you've got a large fraction of hard phase, then you will get void formation because the mountain side won't deform until the ferrite has hardened. And if the ferrite is accommodating all the deformation, that's okay if the fraction of mountain side is small, but it's not okay if it's large. So you're right that we must get the rotation. So I have done a certain experiment that shows in bandline. Mm -hmm. After a certain amount of the strength, the bandline will create a micro void right. inside. But for, for one is that it should be, there should, should not be a micro void existing inside. Okay. Is that because, uh, is that because the fraction of one is smaller? Smaller, yeah. yeah. So that would be consistent. Continue. Yeah. Uh, 
I was feeling a little bit tired, so I thought I would stop there. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me continue. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is the equation that's uh, widely in the literature. Sujimoto, in particular, uh, has uh, used this equation. That this is the starting one fraction of austenite, and this is how much austenite remains as a function of the plastic strain. And there's a, a constant K here, which is different for every seal. Now, that will tell us how stable the austenite is as a function of strain. And nobody has explained the origin of this equation, but it's actually very simple. If you, if you assume that the amount of martensite you get is proportional to the amount of austenite that is left, and you integrate it, then you get this equation, which I'll call the Sujimoto equation. Others have also used it. But he has published uh, a lot of analysis like this, which is a very useful work, very useful work. But the constant k is different in every case. Yeah. So that's unsatisfactory because if I want to predict how the austenite will transform as a function of strain, then I need to know the constant k. Yeah. And there's nothing here about allowing element effects. So what we did, we assumed that a constant k can be replaced by another constant, k1, which is independent of allowing elements. And the alloying element effect comes in through the driving force for martensitic transformation. Now, of course, we can calculate that using thermocalc or whatever. Yeah. So, supposing I can find the value of this constant, then I should be able to calculate the stability of the austenite as a function of plastic strain for any steel. And we looked at all the literature on trip assisted steels, and it covers. Uh, this is the concentration of carbon in austenite. Covers very large range of chemical composition yeah. and temperature of the <coughs> And we derived the value for the constant K1, and we took account of alloying element effects simply by using, uh, sorry, simply by calculating this using, you know, empty data, which is like thermocal. You can see that for all those steels, we can predict using one single constant, K1, for a huge variety of steels, we can predict the amount of austenite as a function of plastic strain. And therefore, we can do calculations like this, that how, as a function of temperature and plastic strain, the austenite uh, will be composed. Now, in most experimental results, you can see that although we start with about 12% austenite, even after a large amount of plastic strain, we've still got austenite left. So not all of it is transforming. You know, earlier on, I showed some experimental results. And even after 25% plastic strain, there was about 5% retained austenite remaining. So it's, it's really transforming at the very late stages of reaction. And you can even you can even design the alloy so that you know you can get no transformation at high temperature. Sometimes we use warm forming. So it's possible to calculate uh, roughly how, how that happens. Yeah, see, I'm not used to giving two hours of lectures. Chris <laughs> Embassy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah sure.
So for example, yeah.
is that you know you have inhomogeneous deformation. At first, when you apply the stress, nothing happens to the hard face. In this case, it's a mixture of plain and awesome It remains elastic, and the plasticity is being absorbed by the ferrous. It's only when the ferrite has worked hardened that the harder phase starts to deform. And in the case of the trip assisted steels, the martensite forms even later compared with the dual phase steels. So based on the dual steel, this is the uh, martensite has a very bad effect for the I think it's a very hard and uh, untempered, weak, untempered weak, 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 weak. Very high carbon. So we can make, and make a comparison between two cases. The first one is uh, we have a structural ferrite plus bainite only. Mm -hmm. Another is trip. Trip is uh, ferrite, bainite plus the uh, can also crack. So in this case, because the uh, ferrite, bainite is not any brittle bonds, mm -hmm. so the formability of the ferrite plus bainite should be made in the trip steel. Yeah. <laughs> in our, you know, in our product development uh, experience, it's not even strip steel, it's made of it. That's right. right. Yes. You're absolutely right. But so, remember, we can also have transformation to the market side. It's a beneficial effect to the company. Yeah. So we still so cannot get the answer. <laughs> so so <laughs> the answer is yes. that in the case where you don't have the retained arsenite, you have cementite. So cementite. And in this structure, if I introduce cementite, I get very bad properties. Yeah. So so Pascal Jacques, you know, uh, he's uh, at the Catholic University of Leuven. He's been trying to reduce the silicon level because you know you have problems of uh, scale and so forth. And he has produced a steel with very low silicon, about 0.3% silicon. But by using appropriate transformation conditions, avoided cement type, and just got a small fraction of retained arsenic. So if you can avoid cement type somehow, then you are right. You will, even without the retained arsenic, you should get good profit. But the trick is, how do you avoid that cement The other way is to get the most as small as possible. You get it more stable. Yeah. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. The finer the austenite, the more stable it is to one and set it What is the end between your base of yeah. Now, at the beginning of that, you see, you are very good because uh, you know some people think there is one end value, but the end value is is not constant in fact. So, at the beginning of this, uh, if I go back to constant, but it's around this, this region. It depends on you know, how much of hard phase you have and soft phase and so on.
but you know the final elongation depends on like void nucleation and it's just too messy. Yeah. Come here. This is in England, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah.